of Nyack's. And I'm in my second tenure there, I was asked to come back. So I'm, in New York, I'm known as the Grover Cleveland of Nyack's chair. So I have a presidential bearing, I guess. So it's been two and a half long years since our last NAG conference held in Minneapolis. We waited and anticipated each year to see if we were going to be able to hold an event, and it's finally here. It's great to see everyone and get reacquainted with peers and colleagues. I'm not sure how everyone here feels, but as far as industry events held each year, NAG was the one conference I most looked forward to. Just to reiterate what John said, when you join NAG as a member, your dues fund the NAG scholarships and programming for the YEO, or Young Executives Organization. As Jan said, we award $5,000 scholarships to member companies each year, and I encourage you, if you've not joined NAG, to do so now. It's very easy to do it here at the conference. I hope you're all uh, prepared to listen, learn, and share. The hallmark of NAG is just that. Every year we are able to listen to a number of burning issues that are impacting our businesses today. Learn as we set out to see more state-of-the-art retailers in a different market. Take the time to share with colleagues during one of the information exchanges and simply enjoy the fellowship of industry leaders. As any conference we attend, if we're able to take one to two ideas back to our companies that we can implement right away, we have more than paid for the price of attending. Our hope is that you all have a great experience over the next two and a half days. With that, I say thank you all for attending and join NAG 2022 and join me in congratulating the incoming chair, Vern Young, CEO of Young Oil Company. Thank you very much. I forgot to put your slide there. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I got to get better on advancing these slides. That's Doug. All right, so uh, we are going to take just a minute. I want to call our speakers up for our first session, which is called Culture as a Competitive Advantage. We have three outstanding speakers, so uh, if you guys want to just take a minute, then uh, we'll call them on up. So Tony, Dave, Tom. Okay, so you're first. All right, thank you. So as I said, culture is a competitive advantage. We have three outstanding chains that uh, I'm sure you're familiar with. Our, uh, Tony Elnemer is the founder and CEO of Noria Energy. Tom Robinson is the chairman of Robinson Oil, Rotten Robbies. And Dave Simon Digger is the president and CEO of Champlain Farms in Vermont. Our first speaker today will be Tom Robinson. Yeah, I remember to advance the slide this time. <laughs> Good job. And that makes it go. No, that's the. That's for this one. Oh, okay. So, good morning. Um, initially, all we thought, or at least all I thought I had to do was to answer some really softball questions from, from John. But then he says, you got to put together a presentation and tell a little bit about your company. So, um, I don't know that I'm going to give you anything that's really great about culture, uh, per se. But, but I wanted to give you a little bit of background of, of how we got to where we are, uh, and maybe there's something that falls out about culture along the way. You know, I, I started thinking about culture, and, and you know, where, where do you, how did you get to where you are? And I think that it kind of falls into three different categories. One is, what are you trying to do? Uh, the second thing is, what are the personalities of the founders of your leadership and your leadership? And then lastly, what's the history of your company? What kind of failures did you have? What kind of successes? How did that change where you ended up? Um, also, when I started putting this thing together and I realized that I wasn't supposed to talk for very long, and I looked at it yesterday, I go, oh my God, I could be talking up here for the next hour. So I'm going to try to cut through some of this stuff and, and uh, unburden you. So the one slide that I definitely did not want to leave off was this next one. Because it just shows I've been in the business for a really, really long time. I kind of I kind of consider myself a giant, you know, in this picture. Anyway, I mentioned how, you know, what are you trying to do? Um, we we didn't have, I mean, we were I'm third generation, we're a fourth generation company. 
we didn't have a vision statement, we didn't have a mission statement, and we started to do some strategic planning with Jeff Bernard back in about 2003, and he says, you need to have a vision, you need to have a foundational piece. And I said, you know, I'm not anti-visions, I just like them all, you know, they're all good, they all sound wonderful, um, and so what do we need it for? So, well, you need to do it. So anyway, what we did, what we did is we put together something that, that sort of made sense for us. We tend to be relatively simple. And really what we said that we wanted to be is we wanted to be a good company. It's not something that I can tell you that we're a good company because that's just a bunch of BS. But we have stakeholders. And, and I think it really, really starts, it always starts with employees. And if our employees say that we're a good company or we're at least not a bad company, uh, we're, we're doing okay. If our customers are shopping with us, if, our com you know, if we get along with our community and neighbors, if we're getting along with our vendors and we're making a little bit of money and the shareholders are happy, I think that we've checked all the boxes off and we're making some pretty good progress. And so that's really what we attempt to do is we, we're just trying to be a good company. And we've actually got a little tagline that we're just trying to be good. So that's really all we try to do. <laughs> In all honesty, we screw up every day. When you're doing thousands of tra transactions, you screw up all the time. But it's aspirational. What we're trying to do is we're trying to, we're trying to be a good company. So a little story on, on us is, is really a story of two companies, uh, Coast Oil Company and, and in the day, Matson Petroleum. Let me start off with the Coast Oil side. Coast Oil started in 1935. It started by Herb Richards. Herb was a very innovative and very early successful uh, retailer. He also really believed in associations and meetings like this. He'd love this meeting. He was instrumental in starting our state association. Back then it was called California Independent Oil Markers Association. He was instrumental in starting the regional trade show, the Pacific Oil Conference, which is now something else. Uh, and, and in fact, the, the first executive director was a Coast Oil salesperson who was housed in the off, our office building um, and that before he moved to Sacramento. So he was very involved in association type stuff, really saw a lot of value in it. Anyway, I mentioned innovative. In 1948, he and a partner started the first cell service in Northern California back in 1948. I wasn't born, even if I look like I might have been in that picture. Um, then, later with partners, other partners, they, they, they started this sort of a buying co-op and they called it Star and Bar because it gave nobody an advantage, none of the, 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 the group an advantage. But it was, it was really successful. They had premium stores before, you know, they didn't have convenience stores, they had premium stores, they sold all sorts of stuff. They had a stamp program, they gave away Cadillacs. I think they gave away weekly Cadillacs for a period of time. And, and so it was, a, with a, had, they had a lot of success. In the later part of the 60s, when Shell Oil decided that they were no longer gonna give the independents two cents a gallon as an advantage, they were only give them a one cent advantage, it was really tough for the independents. They didn't do so well during that period. A lot of them went out, a lot of price wars. Uh, they branded up and they became Texaco, but they weren't gonna give away the Star and Bar. So they branded themselves Texaco Star and Bar, which probably didn't sit real well with the Texaco folks, uh, but Star and Bar, quite frankly, was a much more valuable name in that area than Texaco was. That was back in the day when they were doing, typically with locations over 100,000 gallons a month, 100,000 gallons a month, Back then, it was a big deal, and probably the average Texaco was doing about 30,000 gallons a month. So the other side of the company is our side. It started with my maternal grandfather. I say circa 1938. We don't really know. Circa is a better word than about, so we use circa. Um, I tell people that if we thought that we would have lasted this long, we would have actually written it down, but we didn't. Uh, my dad went to work for his father-in-law in the 50s. He sort of had two choices. His father had a general store, and he could have been a clerk. His, his father-in-law had a job or distributorship, gas station type of thing, and he could be a truck driver. He liked the idea of being a truck driver better. Um, my dad was sort of a classic, and, and, and relatively soon after that, so that period of them working together could have only been a couple of years. I don't remember, I, don't, I was too young to know the transition. 
But by the middle 50s, my grandfather was gone. He'd sold to my dad. He also had another like business in another city close, Hollister, that he sold to his other son-in-law. And he was out of the business. He was retired when he was 50s. <laughs> Maybe he was smarter than the rest of us. Anyway, um, so that's how my dad got his start. And then Signal Oil and Gas bought out their distributor in San Jose in 1964, gave my dad an op opportunity to be a commission agent, and so he went up there. And my dad was, was sort of classically a first-generation entrepreneur, risk taker, um, energy, no money, all of that kind of stuff. So that's when we moved to San Jose. So in 71, Signal Oil and Gas gets out of the oil business, and they gave all their distributors an opportunity to, to, um, you know, to, to take over those assets. And Herb Richards comes to my dad and says, hey, you know, in this, this transition, it's going to cost some money. Do you need a partner? My dad didn't think it was such a great idea to have a partner. Um, and he thought that he had Gulf Oil lined up as a supplier. Gulf branded up a whole bunch of the distributors, the signal oil and gas distributors on the West Coast. And he fought, they got to my dad, and he says, and they sort of had their quota. They were done. All of a sudden, he didn't have a supplier, and he really, quite frankly, didn't have the money, which was probably five or $6,000 per location, to put up a new sign and paint the place. He goes back to Herb, and he said, you know, that partnership thing isn't so bad of an idea. So they became partners in 1971. Best move, best move. Biggest impact on our company that ever happened. Coast Oil, uh, and, and prior to this, we were a dealer business, and we we're gonna be a company operation business. And Coast Oil had two things. Coast Oil had, had structure, which you really need when you're doing company ops, and Herb had a balance sheet. Uh, we had neither. Uh, we were using names like Texaco, Star and Bar, Payless, Buy Low, You Save On, those kinds of names. And instead of giving away Cadillacs, we gave away Pintos. It was a little bit dumbed down. Uh, so, <clears throat> we started using the Rotten Robbie name in 73. Um, that's a whole long story. Um, but really what saved our butt was the oil embargo because that company, from the time it was started till the oil embargo, lost money every month, month after month after month. We just, just never made. Finally got healthy when we got into the oil embargo in the gas lines. So at that time, really, we're, we're the, the West Coast during that period had been a very innovate, innovative area. People would come to the West Coast to see what was going on. Um, and, and really after that period, really after that period, in the 80s, the West Coast really is not a retail innovative space in general. Um, we are a very innovative, regulatory environmental space. And certainly, our ability to sort of survive, you know, the regulations and the environmental and all of that kind of stuff certainly impacted, you know, who we are today. Um, and so, that, and that has just continued. It hasn't gotten any better. We are that on steroids. I'm just gonna hit a couple other things. We did our buyout of Coast Oil in 2001. Herb was 88. He would have gone on forever. He knew he couldn't go on forever. He had nobody to transition it to. So we, we, bought, up, we bought it out. It was, it was great for us. Herb did live for another 10 years. He died when he was 98. And classically, he died one of those years where there's no estate taxes. A really smart guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the two of the things that I'll hit is, is we did a branding project with 360 Design, and, and that was important. I, I went to a NAC seminar. With Quinn, Quinn Ricker had a thing called entitled CEO Own Your Brand, and, and, and I think our, our branding was pretty good, but it, it needed to be tightened up, and we worked with, with 360 Design. It was really good because you just kind of you kind of cleaned up some of the branding stuff, and that, that, that sort of helped as we, as we looked at our culture. And then last thing that I'm, I'm going to touch on is, is that we did succession planning and with Mitch Vandiver. And, and I, you know, whoever you do it with, I think it's really important if you want a family business and if you want that culture to continue. Mm -hmm. Because it's really important not only for the family members in the business 
to know what the rules are, but the family business, the family members not in the business to know what the rules are, and the key employees to know what's going on and where you're going to go. And that, that was a big deal. And, and it made for the fact that, you know, I no longer am the president or CEO. I'm the chairman as of the first of the year. So with that, I'm done. I'll let you introduce somebody. I, I put some gratuitous pictures of a couple of locations, and then I'm out of here. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Tom. You know, because we hear all the time about the merger uh, M&A activity uh, in the industry, and I just love to hear from fourth generation companies. Uh, you, you've learned so much through the years. So that will transition to another longtime family owned company. Dave Simoninger is the president and CEO of Champlain Farm. See, I got your slide there. So Thank you very much, uh, Dave Simmendinger. Um, Hockey player. Uh, so, welcome everybody, and uh, we'll tell you a little bit about things that happened in Vermont. Um, just a quick history. Uh, my father, uh, Walter E. Simmendinger, started Wesco um, back uh, after he got done with a career in mobile oil. He worked for them in the 50s and the 60s. In fact, his best friend at Sigma Chi at Syracuse, uh, George Babakin. Um, tried to get him a job at Arco, and because my dad bought gas at Mobile his whole life, he said, I'm not going to Arco, I'm going to Mobile instead, and he started his career. Well, George became the uh, CEO of Arco um, eventually, and we were, had a nice friendship over the years um, between those two. So um, Mobile transferred us from New York to Vermont, um, and then quickly out to South Dakota for six years, down to Baltimore, back to New York City, uh, where my dad worked at headquarters. He finally quit. Uh, and bought his own gas station in Connecticut. So I was pumping gas at nine years old, um, and we had that site for two years, and then we, so, then we sold it and bought a repair garage. There were no stores, this was repair garages only. Uh, bought one gas station up in Burlington, Vermont. So in 1970, we started our career up there. Um, in high school in 1978, my dad dragged me and a friend off to a little town up in uh, northern Vermont called Enosburg Falls, and I built my first store because the mechanic, once again, got out. And we had figured out how to have self-serve gasoline. So I took off to college. I wanted nothing to do with this business. I was a chemistry major. Uh, I was studying all sorts of complex ways to uh, uh, unbelievable problem solving. Uh, a really good background for this industry because when I got out of college, this seemed to be a piece of cake uh, in terms of solving problems with people and buildings. Uh, but it, when I graduated, Golf and Exxon both sold all their assets um, um, in Vermont and really put us on the map. So I delved right in and continued to do what I had been doing, which was designing stores, um, uh, you know, designing food courts, uh, fueling layouts, all that stuff, uh, and uh, made a lot of mistakes. I mean, you really didn't have any background in this. Um, but everything was wrong, right? I mean, the coolers were too small, the electrical engineers I trusted uh, were putting in electrical systems that were too small. Um, we had air conditioning blowing on coffee bars, we had bathrooms in the wrong place. It was just a lot of mistakes, but it does make you better, right? You, as long as you recognize that these were mistakes, you build the next door better. Um, I hired a really good crowd of guys. We stole a bunch of them from Cumberland Farms. Um, some of those guys have been with, they've been with me almost 30 years now, and it's like been a family of uh, great teammates to, to really help me uh, do the problem solving it's taken to run um, our stores. And we all had a lot of suppliers that came to my uh, aid to help me with layouts, um, whether it was food service or equipment, um, just decades of great supplier relationships. And we also had, we were considered a chain. Now, that gave us chain buying, and what a powerful thing that became for us, because we had that advantage over those independents. Um, so to understand culture, how's this work? You got it, the big one on the, on the right? Sorry, uh, yeah. we didn't practice. It's a small no. button. No, this one. Mm -hmm. So to understand um, the culture of, of Champlain Farms, you really need to understand, or any chain, you have to understand where you're from. You know, who are your neighbors, who, who is your customers, um, where are you located, what are your expectations, what do people expect of you? Um, so here we are, we're up in northern Vermont, okay? Uh, we, this whole state only has 600,000 people, right? We're not even a good city in America. Um, and we're up, we're up against the Canadian border. Now, 
right above us is our biggest market is Montreal, and that's all French. Uh, they don't have English signs in Quebec, but there's two and a half million people there. So you, you better understand how the, the French work, okay? Because they, they like to come down and buy their gasoline. They have all that free health care, right? But they do pay, like California here, $6 a gallon for gas and $8 a gallon for milk. But they do get free health care. Um, <laughs> when, when I used to coach hockey, um, I remember bringing the, uh, the kids over the, in, into Quebec. We used to love to play the Canadians, right? Because we were right there. And one of the kids was looking out the window and he goes, hey coach, he says, is that a factory? And I said, well, well, hold on. And I said, let's get everybody to take a look. He said, I said, look guys, uh, look, there's a, a thousand cars around that building. The lights are on and there's smoke coming out. Yeah, that's a factory. See, Canada protects their jobs. Vermont got rid of all the factories and we'd send all of our jobs over to China because they'd probably make shoes up here, okay? But Canada doesn't work the same way um, uh, Vermont does. So, um, so we have tremendous uh, French influence up there. Um, we, have, we have a government that is very anti-business. Um, we, we have high taxes. Again, we don't have a lot of people, we don't have a lot of industry, so um, they're abusive to business. I, that's all I can tell you. Um, we have high electric rates. Um, we are the only state that's regulated, right? Every other state in New England, you can choose your utilities, not in Vermont. You're gonna pay all the money for the electricity. Um, high property taxes. Um, we have some of the toughest environmental regulations, and, and that changes how you do business, okay? Um, so, um, it's hard to hang on to employees. It, it's, it's been a brutal two years. I honestly don't know how, how we do it, except, you know, pay matters. Our biggest expense is payroll, and you better be ready at, in the moment to, to give that person that raise if they're walking. Or you can run the shift yourself. You can just go work all night, and uh, they don't care. But uh, it's, it's, it's a brutal business, very challenging uh, to make money in Vermont. So, I'd like to uh, just share a couple concepts um, that um, tie into those last two areas of high electric bills and, and, and uh, tough environmental regulations. Now my first one's called the Tunnel of Love. Um, this was a quick family uh, vacation um, that where we took family around New England and we we're down around Albany, New York and uh, this was not on the bucket list but I spotted it off the exit and I said, you know what, my dad took me here when I was young, we're gonna go. So we took the family into those elevators and we went down 15 stories. All right, and you go down there and you, you walk around all these caves, you get on a boat, you go in about a half a mile, there's a wedding chapel down there, I think 500 people have been married down there. It's a cool place, right? So here it is in the middle of August, and I'm driving back, um, back to Vermont, and, I'm, and we were gonna build our next store that fall, and I was thinking, man, under my walk-in cooler, it's 35 degrees year round, I wonder if I could put some kind of cavern or tunnel under the walk-in cooler. And uh, when I was at UVM, that's the University of Vermont right there in our beautiful lake, um, I took a course, uh, thermodynamics, and we studied concrete. We learned how concrete really holds a lot of cold and heat for long periods of time. And I said, wow, I wonder if I could put a thousand cinder blocks under my walk-in cooler. You know, structurally, they'll hold the cooler. They've got holes in them. I'll just migrate the uh, air down through them. I said, wonder if I can cool the store. And so this was the store we built in Essex when I got back that fall. Um, that's kind of my design. Another thing I'd learned on that trip around New England, I saw some things in Pennsylvania I didn't like. I, I saw some stores that really bothered me and I, I swore I would never ruin the landscape of Vermont. I was gonna try to design something that had architectural shingles, some bricks, something that could fit into the neighborhood and not just be a big horizontal placard with bright red and yellow and, and just something that would, to me would ruin the New England type of landscape. So I came up with this cape design and it seems to fit in pretty well, roadside America. But, what am I aiming at? So this was my first design of this concrete vault that's gonna go under the walk-in cooler, okay? And uh, we stacked it with cinder blocks. And there she is. Um, now, I'm not an engineer, uh, but I do think it's, ch it's cheaper to cool cool air off the floor and heat hot air off the ceiling. Uh, so I designed a cabinet um, where we take the air uh, from the floor, which is like 60 degrees, run it through the blocks, put it into the store. And, and much more on the cashier, we want to keep the cashiers nice and comfortable. Well, we hadn't really opened the store, we just turned this thing on, and that building was 40 degrees the next morning. And I'm like, wow, this is really cool. <laughs> we got free air conditioning. 
Uh, typically, our stores need two air conditioning systems, two four-ton systems. Um, but if you've got a tunnel, you only need one. Um, in fact, we have one store that has no air conditioning because it faces north. It has no afternoon sun coming in, and only the tunnel keeps that store cool all year round. This is the shaft inside the cooler where the air blows up through and then over to the blower and onto into the store. So that's, and of course, if you've got comfortable employees, you know, keeping that store cool, you're saving money. You didn't have to put the air conditioning system in. You save money on the refrigeration and Freon and maintenance and all that stuff. You got more money to play with. You got more money to pay your employees. And what do you get? Happy employees. All right, my next, I'm gonna jump over to environmental compliance, okay? Right across the spectrum here. Um, Vermont uh, just have been a really, really tough state to deal with. Um, it's been, it been, been a big challenge. I mean, I, I, there's a lot of crazy uh, laws. I mean, Vermont has this grid system, okay, that goes horizontal and vertical, and God, that's how they calculate fines and penalties. God forbid you get a second offense or you actually have a leak because you're gonna pay big fines. And I've seen my competitors pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to fines to be in the paper. I've been in the papers, I paid fines, and it really bothers me that here I am trying to build this nice family business and do so many correct things in these communities and help everybody, giving away gas, giving away cigarettes, you know, doing all the right things, putting people to work, and then these people come along and they sting you, I and mean, these, these state stings are incredible, right? They come in, they bust you, and they give you NOAVs, and, and off you go, you're paying fines. You know, here's, here's, here's a typical day to day. This, this is a tank, we're talking about tank monitors now, I mean, underground tanks, and we, not, one thing we don't want to do is leak gasoline out, my God the last thing we want to do, but here's an L2 alarm. You'd think if you buy a, a piece of equipment like this from a tank monitor company, it might help you understand what the problem is, okay? But that's an L2 alarm, and do you think anybody at the store understands what an L2 alarm is? Heck no. You think anybody in the office would understand that? I mean, we try to teach people in the office, but it's, it's so challenging, because they have no idea what's going on under the, with double wall tanks, double wall pipes, uh, sump alarms, that kind of stuff. You know. Here's an open alarm, an open alarm. And these things are getting generated every day from different stores. You, that certainly doesn't mean that the store is not open, right? Here's one, we lost the power and now we got setup alarms going off. All right, so that's what I said, you know, I've got to come up with a, a better way here if I can. And I came up with call, what's called the tank monitor report. And basically this is like our Bible um, where what we do is we take each location and we've assigned what it's gonna take for the site to be compliant, okay? So in this case, this particular store we highlighted, you can't read it, it says all functions normal, all right? This particular store not only does it have to have all functions normal, but it's gotta have three passes because those are single wall tanks. This location's got 11 passes on sensors. That's what it has to have. You don't need to understand anything about that. All you gotta do is match it up, okay? You're gonna compare that to what the store has, and if you do, we're gonna be good. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna, and we're gonna do all this with two colors, okay? We're gonna dumb this down to, to two colors, a yellow and red, okay? So if it's yellow, it means we don't have any data. This is how we're gonna start our month. We've got every day across the top of 31 days. We've got all the stores on the left side, they're all in red, because every store is a potential problem. All right, now we start to fill this in, and you can start to see, as, as, the, as, we, if, as we see what we wanna see, we turn it white, it kinda goes away. If we don't have the data, it stays yellow, but if it's showing us <clears throat> anything beyond what we're supposed to see, we're gonna turn it red, and you don't need to know what the problem is, you're just gonna keep it red, streaking across, and you're gonna send it to the environmental team who's got more, more help than you can imagine out there in the field, and it's up to them to fix it. But on the left side, you can see more and more sites are coming off the, off the grid here. Now we finish up, we finish up the month, Right, and uh, this is only for demonstration purposes only, but there's three sites on the left, one still yellow. Imagine that the, the site still has no data in our office at this point because it's yellow all the way across. And then we've got two stores that are red uh, where we never got what we wanted to see. This has been such a wonderful tool and it's so simple because you don't need to know anything about what you're really looking at other than the environmental team and the service guys who are fixing everything. And since we put this in, we've never paid another fine to the state. We have never failed uh, inspection. Um, this has been really rock solid for us, just coming up with a simple solution like that. And of course, you know, when you're not paying environmental fines, 
you're right, and you're not in the papers, and you're not looking like the bad guy, you got a whole lot more money in your chain to, to run with. And of course, then you're gonna be able to pay your employees a lot more money, and uh, you're gonna have a lot more uh, happy campers. So that's pretty much my story, and hope you enjoy it. Thank you. And one of the things that we had talked about, it's significant how those external factors have created your culture. You, you deal, uh, be, being a good corporate citizen matters in Vermont. Uh, your oh, customers, right. if, you, if you're in the right. newspapers, they don't like you. Right. Okay. Right. So, Tony. So our next speaker. Oh, there we go. Uh, Tony. Oh, you have a computer. Tony Unlimer. Thank good you, morning. sir. How are you? Uh, how the you founder doing? and uh, CEO of Noria Energy. Uh, can you see? All right. Yeah, there you go. Good morning. I'm Good. Tony Alnimer. I am the founder uh, and CEO of Noria. From our humble beginnings 33 years ago and our first location in Auburn, Mass., I never imagined that one day of our organization would impact the lives of more than 2,000 dedicated employees, more than 18 million loyal customers, and would span across five New England states, from Hartford, Connecticut, to Waterville, Maine. Today, Noria is a conglomerate company of best-in-class sea store and a car wash division, made up of 170 company-owned locations, 52 golden nozzle car washers, an award-winning Waitley Diner, a successful wholesale organization, and a large dealer network. We are an organization that is indeed more diverse, diversified, and successful. But there is much more to be done. Our company, through its 33 years of growth, has remained bonded to the same ideals that have helped make it successful are those things. Passion for delighting our customers and caring for our employees. A few years ago, our company reached an inflection point in its history. The launch of our Nuria brand, which we are so proud, built on our five team-centric pillars, educate, empower, inspire, incentivize, and still accountability on all level of the organization. This Nuria brand reflects our company's future, strategic direction, mission, and goals. As we continue to build on an enduring legacy of success, we are elevating our mission to withstand the significant challenges our company and the industry as a whole have been facing. From daunting federal and local legislations on every uh, category, to raising labor, cost, and soaring taxes. For us, change is not an option. It is necessary. For these reasons, our organization has been going through a tremendous transformation over the past three years to reposition our business for continued growth and expansion. To this end, guided by our values, I am proud to say that we continue to invest in our people's success through education, empowerment, and by outlining a clear path for growth and career development. As a result, our employee turnover and retention rate has immensely improved. We are also investing in our growth in a number of ways. First, 
we are cultivating a family of proprietary brands with my Nuria, Nuria Cafe Nuria, Nuria's Kitchen, with, with an aim of creating superior value family of products that would complement, not replace, counterpart branded products. In little over three years, we have introduced over 50 of my Nuria branded products and plan to roll out at least a dozen more this year. Our quest for the differentiation is more evident than ever in our new food service initiatives with the launch of Cafe Nuria and Nuria's Kitchen. We continue to expand and heavily invest in our existing MTOs and build new ones. Long before we launched the Nuria brand and our Lewiston site, uh, we were busy working on our internal branding um, because we believe that no matter what brand we put on our building, the reality is the essence of the Nuria brand is its people. So to build a strong brand, we needed to ensure first that our team is engaged and understands their role in turning the Nuria aspirations into reality. Every community and market in which we operate has its own unique character, identity, and charm. We really have a keen appreciation for the uniqueness of each of those communities and markets and understand that consumers' shopping needs are not homogenous. So that factor was really a huge consideration in defining how the new Nuria brand was going to look and feel like. Essentially, our Nuria brand represents a new positioning strategy for our company. So this is a critical step in our evolution as a vibrant and relevant retail brand because C-Store consumers' wants, needs, and shopping habits are really changing. So by effectively implementing this strategy, we hope the Nuria brand can be viewed by our target customers as uniquely differentiated from the rest, and ultimately, and more importantly, more relevant. Our offerings in the two new Nuria stores in Lewiston and Westboro are customized to reflect the consumer needs within uh, the related market and of course, uh, to fill gaps left by the competitive environment. So for, for example, the new Lewiston store entire fresh food offerings is designed to provide customers with a one-stop shopping experience that offers those customers options for uh, grab-and-go food, snacks and beverages, and all the essentials for creating uh, a healthy, fresh take-home uh, meals. Recognizing uh, that the shopping experience is a huge point of interest for uh, customers today and uh, as a means of really inviting customers to sit down and relax and enjoy their meals, uh, we proudly introduced uh, Cafe Nuria, uh, which uh, features uh, full service uh, hot coffee, espresso drinks, iced coffee, wide variety of pastries, parfaits, uh, food cups, and what have you. Uh, all could be served in, in, in the store uh, or through the drive through The unique brand architecture and offerings of the two Nuria stores in Lewiston and Westboro that we have so far, um, the eye-catching, <coughs> inspiring artwork, uh, the color schemes that we pick, um, the lifestyle and community-inspired graphics that are prominent throughout the two stores, uh, and brighter, more spacious layout, uh, clearly reflect our quest to appeal to younger adults and female consumers. Um, and the concentration of products like wide variety of fresh, healthy foods and new age beverages 
are all designed to appeal to customers who desire to live healthy, balanced lives. On our first day of opening, customers of all ages would walk in and would simply say, wow, that's how you know when your brand is appreciated. That's the critical factor. Customers may not be able to articulate it, but they can certainly experience it. That's the wow factor. And we're very fortunate to have done that here. This video outlines the strategy for the brand going forward. Second, our company has grown to the size it is today, mostly through successful acquisitions over 33 years of existence. We continue to look and participate in acquisition opportunities where it makes sense for us in a fiscally responsible way. We have the desire and resources to continue aggressively acquiring assets that fits our standards and our long-term growth strategy. This year and over the next several years, we will be investing millions of dollars in a new, new technology infrastructure and business intelligence platforms in all areas of our business to help augment our value proposition, convenience, and improve our operational of efficiency and decision-making process. In addition, in addition, we are adding more resources and expanding our efforts to grow our dealer network through better re recruitment effort and value-added proposition. Soon, we will introduce a compelling dealer program to support that effort. Lastly, but certainly not least, as we look ahead to the future, I am excited to watch a new generation of leaders, my two sons, Fuad and Badia, to step up to the place and to someday guide our organization to the next heights. I was only in my early 20s when all this began. I'm still young. And I have so much faith in the tireless effort, drive, leadership and power that young people in our organization have. We will need them to help lead our company forward and as I am confident that the spirit of our mission will continue to live on through them, I am beyond blessed that I get to wake up each day and do what I love. My appreciation and gratitude for this gift is unimaginable. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. So uh, we're going to kick off uh, the question and answer period, and I'd actually like to kick it off with um, something that all three of you mentioned, and I want to kind of explore it a little more. And that was all three of you mentioned evaluating your brand So at, at different points in, in your presentation. So evaluating, is that an ongoing process? Is that something you do daily? Is it something you do at, once a year at board meetings? Is it uh, part of, how has that become part of your culture, evaluating who you are and what you offer? Start with Tom. Do you mean our brand or our strategy? The strategy. Okay. Um, no, I, I, I think you've always got to look at your strategy, although we started doing, you know, sort of more formal strategy approaches, and a lot of the stuff you do is just sort of subliminal, I guess. You know, it's just sort of built into your DNA. Um, but we... One of the things that we did, and that we started this really back in about 2003, is, is we went to a one-page strategy um, setup so that it was actually something that didn't go in a binder and get put on the, the shelf. You could actually look at it. So yeah, we, we look at it, and then what we try to do is we look at the things that we need to accomplish that move us along that path. So that's what we do. Okay. 
Yeah. Um, I feel our brand is very, very important. Um, you know, we have a number of interstate locations, uh, a lot of downtown sites, and we just try to tie things together as much as we can, uh, trying to keep things consistent so at least these people coming in know what they can expect. And it's hard because a lot of buildings are different. Um, but again, the more consistency we can create, we think we get more brand loyalty from that. So, okay. Social media has made it very easy for us to communicate both ways with our trust customers in real time. And we have an awesome marketing team that replies to all the comments that our customers post for us. Also, we monitor um, our system or our brands through hiring a third party um, mystery shopper that we created a specific form to visit our stores once a month and do our inspections based on a specific criteria that we use. As well, once a month, our team members in the field have a different form to measure, again, a totally different level on our branding. And those are the two ways we measure on our brands. OK. Uh, all three of you also mentioned employees and the, you know, the labor market being what it is, training, uh, I'm sure turnover is high. Um, what role are employees playing in your brand and in the development of your culture? So, Dave? Um, we have uh, some markets where the stores are very close. Uh, and we often go to uh, those employees, those managers, and say, hey, can you help us in these other markets? And, and uh, that structure, that, it's like a family, being able to pull people and get these people to help us cover shifts, uh, out of stocks, right? The food chain supply has been horrific, uh, so we're running out of products that the suppliers don't bring us. And getting all that delivered and keeping employees and keeping everybody happy, it, it is such a struggle, uh, but we just do so much intercompany networking um, that it's great, and it all starts Monday morning. Right now, it's all happening uh, to figure out what's going to happen later this week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and they'll have it all figured out by tomorrow, I'm sure. Okay. Sorry? Our frontline employees are the face and heart of the company. Uh, they are our brand ambassadors, and they are Noria. We work with them, we train them, we educate them, to ensure they deliver the brand aspirations flawlessly to our customers. Okay. I mean, obviously, they're the key. I mean, there's just no doubt about that. Yeah. And, and retention is, is sort of the, the, the most important thing. My philosophy has always been this. If we overpay them and underwork them, they'll stay forever. So that's one of our strategies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wish they were here to hear that. All right, uh, do we have any questions uh, from the audience? for either one of our three. Greg. Yeah, so I assume for all of you, most retailers in the room, turnover's been up over the last couple of years, and certainly this year has been different, that's changed. What have you done differently in the last seven, 12 to 18 months than you had in the past to help with retention and, and build more impression here for the employee base? Hmm. Who wants to take I'll, that one first? Yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll, yeah. We've run towards paying them more. Um, you know, <laughs> that whole $15 an hour, that's, that's nothing in California, let me tell you. Um, and we've, we felt it so important, so important to be ahead of the game, so we've tried to stay ahead of the game. We've done different things as we, when we were in during the COVID situation. Uh, we've always done an annual profit sharing bonus, and so if we do well, you know, we pass it along. We pass along at the end of the year. We did some early profit sharing bonuses, um, and we actually did pretty well in the year, I guess, 20, uh, that we ended up having a profit sharing bonus too, uh, which, was, which I, was, was a big deal. But we have just continued to really work hard. One of our, you know, we do a balanced scorecard, and we've got, I think, nine different goals. One of the goals is the only thing we really track is the turnover of our full-time, part-time cashiers. And, um, that number is sort of hanging around that 50%, and we're pretty happy about that. We know that we're not always, we know that we sometimes need some more folks, uh, but we're, 
we're doing pretty well, and it's, it's primarily because I think that we're really running towards making sure that we're, we're paying well. Uh, three years ago, uh, we decided to have a survey. And um, everybody told me, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> it was the first survey in roughly 30 years. And we decided to go forward with the survey and we were happy to hear a lot of comments. And we could bucket them in three different buckets. And one, the first bucket was the low-hanging fruits before COVID hit. So we heard a lot from everybody company-wide, how can we better, be a better company? We took those comments, COVID hit, we implemented them in different programs from communication all the way to an entire package, not only the labor hour and how much you're gonna pay me an hour, uh, flexible time, um, uh, tuition programs. We, we offered so many different things that we were able not to lose too many. And as a company, we have a program um, to advance. As we're growing aggressively, we wanted, we believe in promoting from within. We believe in educating to promote from within. And people in our organization saw that and stuck by us through the entire process. So dollars alone don't do the trick. It's the total package you offer and the culture you build and the family values you give them that you care. That's how we won. Uh, you know, we focus a lot on uh, open shift pay. So if that manager is sitting there and nobody's coming in, we're gonna, we're gonna give them some pretty good open shift pay, and that seems to be a pretty good incentive. Uh, some of these managers really don't mind uh, covering that second shift and that weekend knowing they're gonna get 20, 25 bucks an hour. That seems, and it's all money, right? It's, it, it, if there's money there for them, they're gonna work. And I'd rather have the manager work in the weekend than anybody else, because they're the most honest person, hardworking person I got, so. That's, that's worked pretty good for us. But we have had to cut all the 24 hours. We've had to scale things back. Um, it's just the nature of the beast until things get better. I'll just toss out one other thing real quick too, is, is that as we went into the, the COVID, you know, our sales plummeted and we didn't need all of those people. We didn't cut anything back. We, we ran them as, as, you know, <laughs> we had a lot of folks on, on duty. Um, and, and, it, and I remember talking to one cashier that had recently worked in a restaurant and that restaurant had closed and he was happy that he was working. Uh, really in our company, everybody stayed pretty whole through the COVID situation. Probably the only ones that cut, cut back to anything were, were truck drivers uh, because obviously you weren't delivering as many loads and, and we tried to make it up with them some more PTO. So we tried to keep people whole during that process and I think that was important. And they remember that and appreciate that. Okay, any other questions? Come. We, we, ha we have a very specific program that from day one you enter into our organization. We communicate, 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 and communicate. We have a robust training system, internal, that we take them through a process from A to Z before they go to any position within the organization they were hired to. They hear our values, they live our values, they breathe our values. And this is how you could be successful. You know, being the owner, um, I try to spend 50% of my time in the store so I can get out there and meet them. I do get involved with some of the interviews, especially if it's a store manager, but the turnover is not there. It's the cashiers, a lot of the night people, the weekenders. Uh, but we do have training stores in certain areas, so if you're going to come work for us, you're going to go work in a specific store where we got a good manager who's been with us almost 30 years, and she's going to make sure that you're trained in, in how we do everything. That's kind of how it works with us to get them to the right store and the right people. I, the, I think the, the 
for us, the key thing is if you're not having turnover, you're not bringing in massive amounts of new people. Um, and, and, that, and so our folks, I mean, our, we've had a lot of managers that have been around for a long time. We've actually had a lot of cashiers been around for a long time. And our area managers have typically been around for a long time. And so, you know, it, it's really only when you have some sort of a problem, you bring in a lot of people at once, that it's, you really have to educate them, because otherwise the whole organization, the store, educates them. You know, they learn to do, they learn the culture, they really learn the culture from their coworkers, yeah. I think. I mean, we, you know, we do all our training and stuff like that, but they learn the culture from the coworkers, and if you're not having a ton of new coworkers, um, they, do, they do a pretty good job of, of instilling, you know, what we do. Let, let me add one more thing. Um, in our organization as well, we have an MIT program to, uh, to all categories, to all our organizations. As a matter of fact, in our leadership program, we, this year, we implemented something new as the succession plan. So every leader in our organization now has an identified successor. We as a company have a leadership meeting in person once a month. Now we are inviting those successors into those meetings to feel and, and, and work on a succession plan into the future and they can see what leadership team members make decisions on behalf of the company. Now we're letting them be owners and become part of that. And this, this is for me was brand new and the feedback we got was uh, unbelievable. So my, my advice to you, don't keep, if you wanna grow, don't keep everything to your chest. Be honest, be open, be transparent, demand, but be fair. And that's how every company is successful will be. All right, Thank um, you. we are, yeah, the red light's blinking, so that means we're a little bit over. So uh, uh, Tony, Dave, and Tom will all be here for uh, the conference, so if uh, you have questions, you can come up and, and talk to them, but I do wanna stay on schedule. So again, a, a big round of applause for our three wonderful speakers, Thank gentlemen. You.